Nahir Galarza became known as the youngest woman to receive a life sentence for the murder of her boyfriend, Fernando Pastorizzo. This is the story of a bright and attractive young woman who shot her boyfriend at point-blank range twice and watched him bleed to death right before her eyes. How could she have found herself in the role of merciless killer rather than the law graduate she was on track to become? The bloody trail of this 2017 crime blew apart Argentina and is still being hotly contested today. What could have driven her to shoot him once in the back and then once more while looking right into his eyes? How did love and hate become so entangled in her otherwise smart and promising mind? Well, we've got the full scoop, and the answers are coming right up. At just 19 years old, she committed this incredible and brutal crime, perhaps driven by the fear of him leaving her. This tragic story has resonated widely, inspiring the creation of several books, a miniseries, a movie, and even a rap song. But none of this changed the fact that Argentina's justice system hit her with a huge 35-year prison sentence for her crime. It has been six years since these events led to Nahir's historic sentencing. How did this bewildering and tragic scenario unfold? Let's take a step back and delve into the details of this case. And you better believe it shocked us just as much as it's gonna shock you right now. Prepare for a blood-soaked dive into the world of a teenage murderer and the incredible legal and media circus that erupted around her. This is the story of Nahir Galarza, Argentina's Lady Macbeth. The Night of December 29, 2017 On a quiet night, a young couple navigates aimlessly through the stillness of the city on an old moped. The ride seems aimless, or at least that's what one of them believes. The other is consumed with a dark plan silently brewing in her mind. The man steers while the woman holds him tightly in what will become the most fatal embrace of her life. In the early morning hours, under the intense heat of an Argentinian year's end, a faint river breeze struggles to offer relief. Their helmets cling to their heads. Moments before, they had been lost in each other's embrace, a familiar passion and conflict for Nahir Galarza and Fernando Pastorizzo. Young, attractive, and deeply entwined in a relationship marked by love, physical intimacy, disillusionment, and strife. Soon, they're moving on two wheels. He drives with a sense of contentment while she seems somewhat distant. On the surface, she's the picture of calm but inside, her mind is a turbulent sea. The plan she has crafted in secrecy is nearing its climax, a scheme that's set to alter their lives irrevocably. After tonight, nothing will ever be the same. Upon her urging, he veers off, taking a detour down a dirt alley leading to her grandmother's house. He complies, unaware. The area, not a regular part of his routine, is still a familiar piece of Guale Guaychu's urban tapestry. Then, an abrupt, shocking noise breaks the calm, too harsh to be a festive firecracker. Suddenly, he feels a burning sensation. He looks into the eyes of his girlfriend, a partner in a challenging four-year relationship, and sees nothing but emptiness. They tumble from the bike, and he's trapped underneath, a bullet lodged in his back. She continues to stare as if trying to capture his very essence with her gaze. She leans in close, examining him. From his position, he can sense her adrenaline, absorbing the scent of her presence. Caught off guard, Pastorizzo is unable to defend himself or react. Typically, even those accustomed to rough treatment brace for impact, but she gave him no choice. Now, he was truly in his final moments. Pastorizzo struggled to make any sense of the surreal situation. He tried to cover the wound and to stem the bleeding, but it was useless. Instead, all he could do was try to grasp the reality unfolding around him. As his blood-soaked hand shook before him, he knew these were his last breaths. And there his killer stood, watching him. She was moving ever closer right until they were face to face. For her, failure was not an option. The plan had to be foolproof, with no room for hesitation or error. 
If he survived, the consequences would be dire. Not just with the law, but first and foremost with her father, a dominant police officer and the main male figure in her life. That's why she decided a single shot wouldn't suffice. She needed to ensure the end, and so she delivered the final blow. Having learned to handle weapons at 14, she calmly extended her arm and fired again, this time decisively. Fernando, her boyfriend, lay lifeless, his last thoughts unable to fathom why the woman he had just been intimate with had ruthlessly taken his life on that balmy December morning. The girl, meticulously precise in her planning, knelt beside the still warm body. She picked up one of the bullet casings, then froze at the sound of an approaching vehicle followed by a sudden flash of light. It was an unexpected time and place for anyone to be going through that alley. Hoping it was just an animal or a trick of the light, she realized it was neither. As a Fiat Uno neared, panic set in. She cursed under her breath and hastened her escape. The arrival of the taxi in such a secluded area was unforeseen. For a moment, she contemplated eliminating any potential witnesses, but then rejected the thought of further bloodshed. She chose to flee prematurely, leaving behind a crucial piece of evidence, a shell casing that could lead back to her. In these kinds of situations, the result is often decided by the smallest details. Meanwhile, a passerby noticed Pastorizzo beneath the motorcycle. Assuming it was a drunk driving incident, he approached to offer assistance. His thoughts drifted to the recklessness of today's youth. Realizing the gravity of the situation, he discovered Pazzarizzo bleeding profusely. A solitary, bloody tear rolled down the young man's cheek. The passerby promptly called emergency services, reporting what he believed to be a grave accident. As this unfolded, she made her way back home. Her walk was hurried, her breath labored, the weight of her actions sinking in. She had not only ended Fernando's life, but also irrevocably altered her own. She was now a murderer. Arriving home to the familiar landscape of the Costanera and the river, she encountered a past flame, now with his new girlfriend. They exchanged glances, but pretended not to see each other. When people saw her walk in, they saw a calm smile on her face. She looked almost relieved, like the thing she had just done had taken a huge weight off her shoulders. But the horrible truth of what she did was sealed forever. She moves through the kitchen, returning the gun to its regular place atop the refrigerator. The pistol, kept there for quick access, is a precaution her police officer father insists on, fearing a personal attack. Yet no such threat ever materialized. What does happen while he sleeps is that his oldest daughter takes the gun for a far more sinister purpose, to kill her boyfriend. In the aftermath, the young woman frantically scrubs her hands like Lady Macbeth, desperate to remove any traces of gunpowder. She has just committed a murder and, in a daze, retreats to her bedroom, collapsing onto her bed. It's a moment of tranquility following the chaos. Her mind races, relentlessly replaying the night's events. The sex, the motorcycle ride under the night sky, the sensation of the wind, the pull of the trigger, his struggling breaths, the, the blood, so much blood, and the unexpected witness driving by. A quick walk back, then the surreal return to normalcy. She sighs, feeling an odd thrill amidst the turmoil. She knows with a heavy certainty that nothing will ever be the same again, not for her and not for anyone touched by this night's events. But there's one last piece to complete her plan, an alibi. She turns to social media. On Instagram, she writes a blood-tainted message of eternal love to Fernando. I love you forever, my angel. Surprisingly, sleep comes easy to her that night, a respite she finds increasingly elusive in the days that follow. In the immediate aftermath, she could find rest. In the nights after, sleep escapes her. She resorts to sleeping pills for even a moment's peace. When questioned about her restless nights, her struggle to find sleep, she responds with a vacant stare and emotionless eyes. Her haunting reply, Fernando's ghost appears in my dreams. The Verdict Nahir Galarza wasn't in the courtroom to hear her fate sealed. 
in the judicial chambers of Gualeguaychú, Entre Rios province, just north of Buenos Aires, the court delivered its decisive verdict. It refuted Galarza's claims that the killing was accidental, concluding that the shots fired at her partner were intentional. These were intentional and aimed shots, declared the court, convicting Galarza of murder. Because of its proximity to the border with Uruguay and its reputation for lively carnivals, this small city felt the full force of the crime. Accusing Pastorizzo of mistreatment and gender assault, Galarza testified during the trial. Ultimately, the court rejected the defense's motion to consider these allegations as a mitigating circumstance, since they could not locate any evidence to support them. Galarza later confessed that she had lied to 911 and told no one else about what had transpired since, in her words, being injured does not mean that you are going to die. At this point in the trial, everything changed. Pastorizzo succumbed to his wounds before he could reach the hospital, even though someone in the vicinity eventually contacted the authorities. It never even crossed my mind that he was going to die, Galarza stated during the trial. I found out when his mom called me. My heart stopped because she was calling me. That was when I found out what had happened. She asked me if I had been with him, and she told me that he had died. On the day of the murder, Galarza went to a police station confessing to the crime with her father's service weapon. However, her account changed by the time she stood trial. During the proceedings, she claimed Pastorizzo had hidden the gun underneath his clothes after taking it from her house. She alleged they both fell from the motorbike, triggering the gun's first discharge. She then asserted that she picked up the weapon and it fired again. The judges were unconvinced by her narrative. A ballistic expert's testimony was crucial as he ruled out the possibility of two accidental discharges. Security camera footage from the neighborhood also contradicted Galarza's story. The footage showed her walking home at a normal pace, not exhibiting the shock and confusion that she claimed to have experienced. Another critical piece of evidence was a photo Galarza posted on Instagram the morning after the incident, showing her and the victim, accompanied by the text, I'll love you forever, my angel. Nahir Galarza's Story In the world of crime, some cases resonate more deeply than others, often when the perpetrator draws more fascination than the victim. In Latin America, Ricardo Bereda, Carlos Robledo Pooch, and Yia Moreno are notable examples. Nahir Galarza is another such case. The early hours of December 29, 2017 marked a defining moment in Gualeguaychú. Just two days shy of the year's end, the city was unaware of the impending crime that would grip its community and ultimately put Argentina's most notorious female murderer behind bars. The revelation that Fernando Pastorizzo was killed by his girlfriend, a young, blonde university student from a middle-class background and the daughter of a police officer, sent shockwaves through the media and public. Until then, the case was just another sad entry in the local police records. Nahir's image, with her long, straight blonde hair and seemingly angelic appearance, belied the emotional coldness she displayed upon confessing to the crime. Much focus was directed toward the case. It was front page news, featured prominent figures, and covered by special reporters all day, every day. The Pastorizzo case evolved into the Nahir case. Many took an interest in Nahir as a person, her convoluted life story, her interests, and everything in between. Everyone couldn't believe this seemingly ordinary girl could murder her partner in such a calculated fashion. The drama, action, and sexual intensity of her broadcast trial were mixed with real-life contradictions, lies, and deception, making it even more thrilling. The story turned into something like a best-selling novel that was passed off as news. A key point of contention was the claim of gender violence. The defense suggested that Nahir was a victim and Pastorizzo the aggressor. But how much of this was true and how much was legal strategy? If Nahir were male, would the debate over her deserving the harshest penalty under our penal code be as intense? The relationship was rife with toxicity, mutual aggression, accusations, and demands shrouded in secrets and mysteries. Their relationship was filled with toxic elements of possessiveness, anger, and cheating on each other. 
This negative cocktail turned their relationship into one of conflict, and it showed in their public digital lives. WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter all showed conversations and arguments that illustrated their relationship problems. Should there be no charges or leniency in her sentencing, Nahir faces 35 years in prison, only regaining her freedom at age 55. And so, a question lingers, one that many ponder but few can stomach to answer. How can a good girl, potentially anyone's daughter or neighbor, be capable of such extreme actions? Consequences and Context Nahir Golarza holds the unfortunate distinction of being the youngest woman to receive a life sentence in Argentina at the time of sentencing. She was 19 years, 7 months, and 21 days old. However, she wasn't the youngest at the time of committing the crime that led to her sentence. In a similar case in 2016, also in Entre Rios, Paola Araceli Benitez was sentenced for murdering her mother when she was 18 in April 2015. By the time of her sentencing, Benitez was just slightly older than Galarza, being 19 years, 8 months, and 1 day old. A stack of photographs, phone conversation transcripts, and emails were among the documentary and testimonial evidence. These were some of the most important elements that supported Galarza's conviction. Expert evidence was also important in putting an end to the idea that the gunshots were an accident. The expert said there was a 50% chance that the first shot was a mistake, but it was clear that the second shot, fired from only 50 centimeters away, was entirely intentional. The court also threw out the defense's claim that Pastorizzo had been violent towards Galarza. This fact has remained controversial. Imprisonment Details on September 4, 2018, it was confirmed that Nahir Galarza would be moved to a women's facility at the Parana Criminal Unit 6. This transfer came after she exceeded the maximum time allowed for a prisoner to be held in a police station, having spent eight months at the Children and Women's Commissariat. On September 10, the transfer to the Criminal Unit No. 6 Concepcion Arenal in Parana was officially executed. This facility is the sole women's prison in the province of Entre Rios, and here Galarza shares a pavilion with nine other inmates. In a legal development in August 2019, the Concordia Criminal Cassation Chamber dismissed an appeal from Nahir's defense. As a result, her life sentence was upheld. Reports in the same year indicated that Galarza was actively pursuing studies in psychology as part of her prison activities. In March 2020, the Supreme Court of Justice of Entre Rios further rejected an appeal against Galarza's life sentence. To date, Galarza's defense has made two attempts to appeal the sentence, but both were unsuccessful. Life Behind Bars on her first night in the Entre Rios Penitentiary, Nahir Galarza was placed alone in a cell, a rare occurrence given the strict regulations of the facility. The following day, her birthday, gave a brief respite as her family was allowed to join her for a three-hour lunch. An unusual day, starkly different from her past celebrations and likely similar to those in her future. After the visit, Nahir adapted to her new environment among cellmates known for their non-violent behavior. There had been concerns about a potential encounter with relatives of Claudio Cagnette, a drug trafficker killed by her father in 1996, but such fears were ultimately unfounded. The prison authorities promised Nahir would only interact with non-violent cellmates. She was granted daily recreational time, the opportunity to continue her law studies, one phone call per day, and bi-weekly family visits. On September 15th, less than a week into her sentence, she used her phone call to give an interview to the website Ahura, her first since incarceration. She spoke with journalist Elias Moreira, who facilitated the interview through former official Bordera and sought to clarify what she termed misunderstandings. Much of the journalism has only been about speaking ill of me and taking everything out of context, she said, expressing annoyance rather than anger. She thought that the news stories about her had made people hate her for no reason. The interview, which lacked visuals and was later broadcast on Channel 9 in Parana, ended with Moreira sensing her emotional state, possibly tearful, after a call from her mother. This was an act of defiance, as neither her lawyers nor parents had authorized her to speak. 
In the penitentiary, Nahir found a semblance of dialogue, something she had missed at the minor and women's police station. Her initial challenge was to change the first impressions of her fellow inmates. Do you think I'm crazy? They say I was painted as a crazy person. She felt vindicated when their response was, ah, you aren't as crazy as they said. Her transfer was noteworthy, occurring at 4 in the morning in contrast to the usual practice of daylight transfers. The journey from Guali Guaychu to the Penal Unit 6 of Parana, covering 287 kilometers, was a road her family would frequently travel, starting with her 20th birthday celebration, which was granted as a special visit. The decision to house her in Penal Unit 6 came as a surprise. The Galarza family had hoped for her placement in Penal Unit 9 Colonial El Potrero in Guale Guaychu, citing better conditions and proximity. However, she ended up in the only women's prison in the province, sharing a cell with three other inmates, including two wives of policemen involved in a narco gang. The move went against the rules for the penitentiary service of Entre Rios, which was a big change from how they usually do things. The anticipation of her transfer was an open secret, done under the cover of darkness to avoid any incidents. On September 14th, the Galarza family partially fulfilled their promise to relocate closer to Nahir. A moving truck was parked outside their home, signaling the beginning of their new life divided between Parana and Guale Guaychu, a show of their commitment to support their daughter. Legal Struggles and Appeals in January 2022, Nahir Galarza, under new legal representation and with her mother, Yanina Crow's support, filed a complaint against her father, Marcelo Galarza, which was eventually dismissed. Despite this, a restraining order now prevents Marcelo Galarza from approaching his ex-wife, Crow, and the prison where his daughter is held. The national court remains the defense's final hope to overturn the life sentence. The court dismissed the defense's assertion that the gunshots that ended Galarza's boyfriend's life were accidental, concluding that they were, indeed, intentional. The defense's hypothesis of involuntary gunshots has been disproven, stated the court. The decision, made by judges Mauricio Doruri, Arturo Dumont, and Alicia Vivian, was reached swiftly. Galarza's legal team has confirmed their intention to appeal the decision. The verdict really caused a major divide in Argentina. This has been particularly apparent on social media. Online, a lot of Argentinians and South Americans questioned the judiciary's speedy handling of the case. They compared it to other cases involving violence against women, where often it has been claimed the woman's claims have not been fully investigated. The same Guale Guaychu court that tried Galarza also presided over the Susana Villaruel murder case. The Aruel was killed by her former partner, Ramon de la Cruz Ortiz, who was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment just three months after the incident. Court Procedure Details Three main points were argued about in court by the defense and prosecution. They can be summarized like this. 1. Nahir Galarza meticulously planned the murder, characterized as a psychopathic killer who understands her actions but feels no guilt. On December 29, 2017, in Guale Guaychu, she killed her boyfriend, Fernando Pastorizzo, allegedly because he intended to leave her. 2. Nahir shot Fernando twice because she was being abused physically and mentally. The defense aimed to show that she was a victim of gender-based discrimination and violence. 3. Nahir is psychotic, seeing things that aren't there, described as mentally unstable. Claims of childhood sexual abuse by her uncle, abuse by her mother, and speculation that her father, policeman Marcelo Galarza, was the actual murderer. Fernando Pastorizzo Every facet of Nahir Galarza played its part in one of Argentina's most captivating crimes. As we mentioned, this homicide has even inspired a rap song, whose lyrics remain available even though the song itself has been removed from the web and the artist cancelled. The song, by rappers Paul and Mike, told a narrative of surrender to overpowering and dangerous love. Returning to Nahir's case, each version of her story, shaped by psychological evaluations and legal strategies, awaits its fate, with the outcome still uncertain. While her appeals have so far failed, 
As of December 2023, more information is coming to light about the case, which could lead to further appeals in future. Nahir Galarza's Appeal Whether viewed as a murderer, victim, or mentally unstable, each interpretation of Nahir went to seek validation in the Supreme Court of Justice of the nation. This was the final avenue for the youngest woman sentenced to life imprisonment to challenge the ruling that placed her in Argentine criminal history. There were many rumors about what the court might decide. For example, some said that the judges might think about giving Galarza a new hearing and even looking into her father as a possible perpetrator of the crime. However, the reality was different. Nahir's defense appeal was with the criminal opinions area of the Attorney General of the nation for almost two years, and the decision was not favorable for Nahir. The appeal, received by the court on October 29, 2020 and transferred to the Attorney General's office in November 2022, was handled by José Ostalanza and also bears the signature of Raquel Hermida Layenda. Lyanda, who joined as co-counsel in July 2020 and was dismissed in November 2022, advocated a high-impact hypothesis. Her involvement, however, did not alter the decision by the court. But nevertheless, it was Lyanda who opened up a new front in the courtroom battle, Nahir's psychological state at the time of the murder. Schizophrenia and Psychological State Despite not receiving formal notification of her removal, Lyanda continued to contribute to the case, including a report stating Nahir is schizophrenic. The defense claimed that the court's assessment of evidence was arbitrary and that international gender violence covenants weren't considered. The appeal was taken to the Supreme Court in complaint because the Supreme Court of Justice of Entre Rios deemed the original appeal irrelevant. Within the 38 pages of the defense's arguments, numerous points are raised, nine specifically addressing acts of gender violence. However, getting the prosecutor or the court members to align with the defense's perspective is another matter. A key point. The latest psychiatric evaluations of Nahir conducted post-trial suggested schizophrenia under the theory that her father was the actual murderer. However, these evaluations hold relatively little value, contrasting with official ones and submitted after the complaint was filed, which might lead to them being overlooked. If the court decides to review the complaint, it will likely focus on the arguments presented in the 38 pages submitted by the defense in October 2020, after the Chamber of Cassation of Concordia and the Supreme Court of Entre Rios upheld her life sentence for aggravated homicide by connection. The defense doesn't argue for an insane Nahir or an abusive father in their complaint. Instead, they focus on alleged gender violence, claiming arbitrariness in evidence admission and evaluation and violation of international treaties on gender violence, thus asserting the federal nature of their appeal. This is the angle Nahir's defense has been using in court, closely monitored by plaintiff lawyers Ruben Maria Virué and Juan Carlos Peregallo. While other theories could be considered, they appear more as legal fireworks than substantial arguments. The dismissed lawyer's support of the sexual abuse and murderous father theory does little to bolster the case for an unimputable insane Nahir. The accusation, verbatim from the sentence that led to Nahir's life imprisonment on July 24, 2018, for qualified homicide for being of a person with whom she maintained or has maintained a relationship, details the events of December 29, 2017. This sentence says that Nahir, who was riding a moped with Fernando Pastorizzo, shot him twice, once from behind and again while he was lying on the ground. It was clear that Nahir wanted to kill him. Text messages with Fernando, witness statements, ballistic experts' opinions, and surveillance video were all important in securing her conviction. The Relationship Dynamics Initially, Nahir Galarza tried to distance herself from the murder by claiming she wasn't even with Fernando Pastorizzo, then confessed and even at one point suggested he had killed himself. During the trial, she claimed it was an accident. However, the judges didn't buy her story, largely due to a psychiatric evaluation provided by Dr. Simon Giglioni on February 27, 2018 and later confirmed in court. Nahir was capable of distinguishing right from wrong, legal from illegal. 
According to the psychiatric evaluation conducted on February 6th, 7th, and 9th, 2018, and an analysis of legally relevant medical data, there was no indication of mental incapacity or disorders that could have impacted her ability to understand her actions or influence her decision-making at the time of the incident. Interviews with Nahir Galarza in prison revealed no signs of post-traumatic stress. The expert's report stated, There was no evidence of symptoms compatible with post-traumatic stress. The presence of symptoms of re-experiencing the trauma was not observed. There were no symptoms of trauma avoidance, no symptoms of automatic hyperactivation. The referred symptomology, anguish, does not cause clinically significant discomfort or social deterioration at work or other vital areas of the subject of cars. Effectively dismissing the defense's claim of gender violence. Gilioni admitted that the evaluation was very basic, but it painted a clear picture of Nahir's mental state at the time of the event, which contradicted the defense's claim that she was a victim of gender violence. Nahir's defense, as presented to the Supreme Court, maintains that she was a victim of physical and psychological violence from Pastorizzo and acted within that context. This claim, which contradicts Nahir's own account during the trial of the incident being an accident, hinges on nine key points outlined in their brief. 1. The oral court in Entre Rios confirmed injuries on Nahir's body through forensic reports. 2. Despite this, these injuries were not attributed to Fernando Pastorizzo. 3. One doctor noted long-standing injuries on Nahir's arms, which she claimed not to remember the cause of. 4. Medical records from the Puigari Sanatorium indicate pre-existing injuries. 5. Nahir recounted an incident where Pastorizzo dragged her by the hair. 6. Whenever Nahir blocked him, Pastorizzo would call her incessantly. 7. Aggressive, degrading, controlling, and violent WhatsApp audio messages from Pastorizzo were presented at the trial. 8. A letter from September 2016 where Pastorizzo allegedly apologizes for his violence and asks for forgiveness. 9. A text message from December 25, 2017 where Nahir tells a friend about Pastorizzo physically assaulting her, corroborating an incident where her friend allegedly punched Pastorizzo for mistreating Nahir. Nahir Galarza's Father and Legal Proceedings Nahir Galarza's legal team, convinced of her victimhood in gender violence, argued for a retrial. Curiously, their complaint doesn't mention Alicia Padai, an expert witness who extensively testified about Nahir's personality and victim status at the trial. Quote, Nahir has a tendency to masochism, to self-annihilate. She seeks perfection. She's always neat, well-groomed. It reflects distrust in others. Susceptible to violence, her coldness demonstrates her learned inability to show emotions. Without saying it, what is interpreted as meaning is, I don't want to suffer anymore, Padai had stated. However, Padai's testimony, given after only a 45-minute interview with Nahir, was scrutinized by the oral court, which even suggested investigating her for possible false testimony, although no further action was taken. As part of Galarza's defense plan, this new angle was added. It comes from expert views that were added to the file after the complaint was filed in May 2021. Quote, from our observations, we conclude that from the age of 15-16, a psychic deterioration would be expressed that affected their quality of life, their social relationships, their adequate connection with reality, and their vitality, and we give a presumptive diagnosis. It meets the diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia. Diagnosis associated in Axis 1 for sexual abuse and forced abortion, post-traumatic stress should be ruled out comorbidity with autism spectrum disorder, reported psychologist Alicia Castro and psychiatrist Enrique Stola. However, this new explosive report, alongside the archived complaint alleging that Nahir's father was the actual killer, is not included in the main complaint. On April 13th, Nahir's former lawyer, Raquel Hermida Layenda, filed a brief as amicus curiae, claiming Nahir is not in a position to decide because she is threatened by her mother and father in addition to suffering from a psychotic illness. A sensational claim, but seemingly more targeted toward media attention than legal efficacy. While the court awaits the ruling of Attorney General Eduardo Casal, Nahir remains a high-profile inmate at the Women's Penal Unit No. 6 of Parana. 
If the court does not rule in her favor, she would only be eligible for parole at age 54, which has thrown up some questions about the length of time for the nation's highest court to decide on her case. Media Coverage and Public Reaction The murder of Pastorizzo garnered extensive national and international media coverage. In the days following the incident, the Galarza family hired a public relations officer releasing photographs of Nahir as a baby and child to the media. Nahir's personal social media accounts received both support and backlash. Her Instagram was initially closed after her arrest, but reactivated 12 days later, quickly gaining over 30,000 followers before being taken down again. On January 2, 2018, a march in Gualeguaychú saw hundreds demanding justice for Pastorizo. The following day, on Pastorizo's posthumous 21st birthday, friends and families shared messages and photographs on social media, calling for justice and expressing condemnation against Galarza. On July 10, 2018, the group Every Prisoner is Political staged a protest in Buenos Aires, demanding Galarza's immediate release and challenging the heteropatriarchy and hegemonic feminism, labeling the media, judiciary, and public opinion as part of a witch hunt against Galarza. In January 2022, it was announced that a series titled Nahir, The Unknown Story, based on the book New, The Unknown Story by Mauro Seta and Mauro Fulco would be produced for HBO Max. Recent Developments and Allegations of Misconduct on December 4, 2023, shortly after her sixth Christmas in prison and as the Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation deliberates on her life imprisonment sentence, the Entre Rios justice system acknowledged that food specialist Gabriela Laino was coerced into performing tasks beyond her expertise. Laino claimed that following Galarza's conviction, she suffered psychological disorders, prompting her to file a lawsuit against the Entre Rios state and the provincial police. In court, Lainio stated that prosecutors compelled her to examine the cell phones of Galarza and the late Pastorizzo in her morgue, falsely presenting her as a computer expert despite her actual qualification in rheumatology and a lack of relevant training. Also, Lainio said that her bosses threatened to fire her if she didn't go ahead with their fake expertise. The labor court system recently ruled in favor of Lainio and told the defendants they needed to pay her 14 million pesos. The court's decision made it clear that Lainio was given tasks that were well outside of her professional area. These included things like computer forensics and forensic photography. She is a graduate in forensic anthropology and works for the Guale Guaychu Departmental Police's Criminalistics Unit, but there has been no proof that she has learned these specific skills or knowledge. Following the verdict, Jorge Zanzini, author of a book about Galarza, commented on the situation. The prosecutor Rondini Caffa, coordinator Lisandro Bejeran, Commissioner General of the Guale Guaychu Department Fabian Perez, and bail judge Mario Figueroa, also a former police officer, formed a perverse association to protect Nahir's father, also a police officer, Marcelo Galarza, to expedite the life imprisonment sentence. The Supreme Court of the Nation, having reviewed the entire case file, is expected to soon decide whether to overturn or uphold the life sentence. Galarza's defense team, led by doctors Jose Ostolaza and Pablo Sotelo, is hopeful that the court will recognize the alleged discrimination and arbitrariness in the Entre Rios justice system as outlined in their federal appeal. Conclusion in both Argentina and Uruguay, there's been a lot of discussion about the murder that Nahir Galarza committed. She was a girl from a small town, and it shocked everyone to see a beautiful young woman with a promising education become a murderer. People became fascinated by the case due to the nature of the crime and the fact that the woman was so young. Then, after the trial, the fact that this was her first offense and yet she was hit with such a tough sentence caused more controversy. The life sentence she received generated intense debate across various media platforms, with some voices strongly opposing such a severe sentence for a young individual with no previous criminal record. Lastly, it reopened a long-standing conversation about the poor record Argentina has when it comes to dealing with violence against women, and whether there are factors in this case that could have been looked at more deeply, such as whether Galarza was a victim of abuse. Despite this, the sector opposing her sentence was relatively small and has become less vocal over time, fading into the background of public discourse. 
concerns have been raised about what reducing her punishment could mean. This was, after all, a sentence given out by a judge for a planned armed murder. Many have asked what it could mean for society as a whole if a lighter sentence had been applied. What kind of precedent would it set in legal jurisprudence? It's important to remember that this terrible event had a clear victim, and it was not Nahir Galarza. This just goes to show how terrible these kinds of crimes are and how important it is to hold everyone accountable to their crimes, no matter their age or upbringing. But it also goes to show that the justice system in Argentina still has many failings and that the calls for reform and accountability should not go unheard.